2 Chronicles 7.14. He talks at the end of this passage about the brokenness, healing. And it's not just a matter of physical, because oftentimes when we think about healing, we talk about somebody that is sick and somebody that is going through something. But he talked about healing their land, talking about the corruption, talking about just the things that invade our lives, invade our government, invade our families and schools. It is hard to get on social media, I don't care what platform it is, and to go through there and not find it filled with hurts. You guys know what I'm talking about. Even last night I was going through and there's this child that was uh, struggling with leukemia that passed away and I get a text message from somebody that is having tests and found out that it's far worse than what they thought and finding out somebody else that their, their job is being threatened. They don't know what's next and what they're going to do and people that are going through just division with their family. And it's like I've done everything to try to mend my family back together, but there's no way that they'll, my spouse will listen to me and my kids just ignore me and there, there's this division and this separation and I, I, I'm frustrated and I don't know what to do. It just hurts. If I was to ask, is anybody in here dealing with the hurts in this room? It's absolutely. And let me tell you, some aspects of this world, it's just the fact that we live in a broken world. Uh, you say, what is the hope for the world? It's, it's heaven. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. And God says, I shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes and I'll make a new heaven and a new earth and all those things. And for people that are lost, they don't get that. But God reboots this system because he brings us back to what the original intent. But can I read this passage again? And he says, if my people, God is talking to Solomon. God is talking to his people. They had just finished building the temple. They were excited about it. They were, had this place of worship. They're expecting the power of God, the Shekinah glory of God, the presence of God to rest upon that place. But God was going to warn them right now. Let me say, you can get excited about the location. You can get excited about what you built. But unless God is in the midst of it, it's just a building. And sometimes we get so wrapped up in the, the physical aspects of what we do. But God was making this promise to them. And I'm not trying to claim the promise of Israel. And I've had people take this verse out of context. This was written to Israel, God's people, a promise to them. We are not trying to adapt ourselves to the promises and the covenant that God made with Israel. But I can tell you that what God was doing is he was talking to his people about getting their heart right, their hearts right and seeking after the face of God. He said, if my people which were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. What is he saying in this passage? He said, I am a righteous God. I think sometimes we all lay it out like, oh, he's, he's your best friend and he is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And you can cast your care upon him for he cares for you. And absolutely all true. But can I remind us that my God is an all-righteous God. He is holy. The Bible says, be holy for I am holy. And he says at the end of this, of all these things that change their hearts, and at the end of this verse, he reiterates, and I will heal their land. God says sin destroys, but God is the opposite of sin, that God reaches into the situation and heals their land. Or heals the situation. Or puts the pieces back together. Or mend what is broken. I know that we're so used to it. You're not going to read this and say, oh, wow. I, I just heard something in church today that I've never heard before. But can we take this a step further? Can we not just read this and say, oh, God's telling us to pray. And I'm not saying that God's not telling us to pray because that is very clear. But it goes beyond the prayer that we say as we sit down at the dinner table. Or the prayer that we say with our kids as they're going to bed. Or the cliche thing that we say as we're getting into the car to go on a trip and we just rattle off the words... There is a different prayer that will come from your heart when you recognize the brokenness of your situation. Yeah. And I think sometimes we don't pray in the way that the Bible is telling us to pray right here because we don't recognize our situation. When your spouse comes in and says, I'm done, I've taken all that I can take, I am leaving you, you'll pray differently. When you find out that you're going in for a CT scan, you'll pray differently. When you find out that there is a, a school shooting down the street and your kids are there, you'll pray differently. 
When you realize that you're losing your job and you have no hope to be able to pay your bills, you'll pray differently. Do you understand that God wants us to step back and realize we are a broken people? We live in a broken nation. And it's broken because of sin. It's not a matter of us not being broken. I think it's a matter of us trying to think in our minds that I've got this figure out or I'll push through. But we can't. So what does he say in this passage? He said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. The word humble literally means to bend the knee, to bring down low, or to bring under subjection. The word humble literally means to bow the knee. They were talking about this in their culture. It wasn't, and, and this is a spiritual aspect of it, but it is also physical to acknowledge the God that we serve. When they would approach the king, they would walk into the presence of the king. When they got into the presence of the authority over them, they would bow the knee before the king to acknowledge respect to the leader, respect for his authority, and placing yourself under subjection of who you're bowing and present in front of. Do we do this? To an almighty God. When we don't bow the knee. And I'm not just talking about physically doing this. But it's an act of surrender to God. It is an act of when 9-11 hit. And a lot of you remember that. That they stormed the churches and filled the front of the, the White House. And they went in front of the Capitol. And they sang amazing grace and lifting up their hands. Because they recognized they were broken and they humbled themselves before God that we need you. But it quickly faded away. I know that happens in the world. But the question is, do we allow that to happen in our churches? See, pride is the opposite of humbling ourselves. Pride is telling God, I'll figure this out. I'll push through. I'll take out more hours. I'll research this more. I'll just do my best. I'll push through. But I'm telling you, nothing of ourselves can fix the brokenness of this world. And I know we know that. But our attitude, when it comes to praying, our attitude, when it comes to coming before God, do we demonstrate that before an almighty God? Proverbs says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We end up falling on our faces when we don't admit to God that we need him. With that hands lifted high in the quiet place of God saying, I don't have this and I am making a mess and I am nothing and hopeless without you. God sees our mess today. Question mark in his mind. Do they not see that I am the answer? Then why are they not reaching out to me? Why are they not bowing the knee before God? Humble ourselves as an act of surrender. Humble ourselves as a cry out to God. When we enter the secret place, we are admitting to God. When we bow our knee in that quiet place of prayer, we are telling God that I don't have this. Can I simply put it like this? If we want change and we want to experience the change in the power of God, the only way that it comes, and God says, first of all, you better come before me and acknowledge who I am and bow the knee before an almighty God. Bow the knee before the one that has the answers, the authority over your life. And then he says, humble themselves and pray. And I know we know this word. I guarantee you, we teach it to our kids. We pray over meals. We pray over decisions that we're going to make. We gather in church. We gather in Sunday school classes and gather in classes and life groups and all the things that we do and say, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. What is prayer? Talking to God. But can I tell you in this aspect of this, when you're broken, when you see your brokenness before God, it goes from praying to what he's saying here. Prayer is more than just talking to God. Prayer is talking to God, but in this aspect, it means, it means to make supplication. That aspect of prayer means to ask earnestly. It's different. We bow before the King of Kings, asking earnestly, if you don't help us, we will fail. There's a passage in Hebrews that he says, let us boldly go before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy to help in a time of need. That's where we find grace. 
Have you ever thought what that means? Is God saying, I want you to boldly go before me. That is, that is not just the aspect of, um, hey God, I need you today and bless this food and I'm thankful for what I have. It's a pursuit of what God has that I'm going to boldly, earnestly, passionately, fervently come before the throne of grace because that is the only place to find help in the time of need. That is it. I don't care who's elected next. They're not going to fix our issue. I don't care if it's Democrat. I don't care if it's Republican or Independent. They don't have the answer. Only the one that sits on the throne of grace and the throne of God has the answer. And if we don't approach him earnestly and boldly, then we are missing out on the authority that he brings. And I know a lot of times... And our culture today is we get up, we pick up the phone and we're pursuing like I'm going through a hard time and I call my mom, I call my dad, I call my best friend, I call my kids. We unload on them. In the religious world that we have in today, they'll go in and, and talk to a priest and pull back the little window and tell them all my heart. But let me tell you what that dude on the other side cannot do. He doesn't know your heart. And the reason why Hebrews 4 in this passage is so powerful, if you go back one verse of why we go boldly before the throne of grace, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. The one that you're praying to gets your pain. He is touched. He knows your heart. He sees your tears. He's moved by your tears. He knows what you're going through. He knows the burden that you have. It's not a guy on the other side of the window. It's the guy that sits, the God that sits on the throne. There's a difference. He cares about the burden that I have. But with the burden that I have, I've got an invitation to boldly, confidently invited to go before the throne of grace. The question is not whether we know this. The question is, do we do this? The Bible says about praying earnestly. In James 5, 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That word right there that the Bible is describing is way different than now I lay me down to sleep. It's way different than thank you for this food. The Bible is describing there the effectual fervent prayer. That passage right there, those words together mean to be fueled with passion. To be fueled with passion. Literally mean to be fired up in such a way that you are burdened and broken and I am going to get to the throne of God and nothing's going to get in my way. There's no schedule, people, or distraction in this world that could stop me. Have you ever thought when Jesus prayed in the garden, he was praying over the needs of humanity? And the Bible says he prayed more earnestly to where he sweat drops of blood over the, over the sins of you and I. Have you ever thought of the different prayers in the Bible of the prayer of Jabez, which is prayer of passion, the prayer of Jonah from the bottom of the whale? Have you ever talked about Jairus? As he walks into the presence, no, he runs and throws himself at the feet of Jesus, asking for God to heal his daughter. I promise you it was, it was a passionate prayer, a passionate pursuit of God. Have you ever thought about the prayer of Hannah where she says, literally, give me children or just let me die when we want the things of God so much that we're willing to put it all out before him, we lay before him, we raise our hands in desperation of God. When Jesus was teaching us about prayer, he used different verses to illustrate it. He, he, he said about if you ask, request. He talked about seeking. And he talked about you shall find. And in Luke eleven nine, 9, he says, knock and it shall be opened to you. It was three different aspects of it. One was a matter of just asking, God, I need help and I need prayer. The next one is pursuing a little bit. The next one is arriving at a door. Back in the Bible times, they didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have ceiling fans. They didn't have circulation like we had. So they'd open all their doors and windows. At night, they would close them for security as they slept. And out of respect of each other, they didn't just knock on each other's doors unless something was going on where they knew that there was a time of desperation and they would walk up to that door and they would knock on it. But they would say that it wouldn't be this passive thing. If someone was dying or somebody was hurt, it wasn't just a matter, okay, I'm not going to bug them. The Bible is talking about ask, seek, and knock, and keep on knocking, keep on knocking. It was a matter of going to the throne of God in desperation and knock on it to the point where you're waiting for God to give some sort of answer or result. Do we pray as a church or pray as God's people in such a passion 
that we knock on the throne of grace or the throne of God in such a way that our prayers echo through the gates of heaven. To knock and keep on at knocking. I think sometimes we get this hyped up services, emotional feeling from a song. We go to teen camp, we go to some sort of revival, we sit in some sort of service, our heart is moved and we're touched by it. And we go to the altar and we pray and we get up and we go back to the same thing that we were doing because it's a feeling that we go through. But God was saying when you have this, you knock and you keep on knocking, you keep on pushing, you keep on asking. I'm not going away until I experience what God has. And on the other side of it, the Bible says, knock and it shall be open to you. God literally says that there is an answer of something and it's not always the answer that we want, but I promise you, he'll never leave us outside. There's a difference. I think the cliche praying and just going through the motions and the apathy that we have. We pray for revival. You know what apathy is? Is the fact that we get comfortable and we just stay there. We don't ask for more. We don't pursue God for more. The next aspect of this verse is he says, seek, humble yourselves, pray, and seek your face. And I know that I've preached this many times But the word seek literally means to strive after, to ask, to beg, to desire. It means a pursuit of something. What are you pursuing in your life? I'm not asking what you're asking for. But have you ever thought when God offers more in life and God says, I am the satisfaction that you need and I am the Jehovah Rapha and I am the Jehovah Jireh God. I am the Elohim creator of your life. I am all these things. And we sit in our seats and we don't bow the knee. We don't lift our hands towards God and surrender. We don't pursue him in prayer. We don't knock and keep on knocking. But we step back saying, where is God? Have you ever thought that God's looking down at us and saying, where are you? Where is the tears that come from the brokenness of your situation? Where is the surrender, acknowledging that I am the only hope? We are the generation that can get so caught up on a Netflix show that we can binge watch it for eight hours, but we get lost when we pray for five minutes. We are the generation They get so caught up in spending our money on the next gadget and thing that they have to offer, but we don't have anything to give before God. We are the generation that can spend hours doing our favorite hobby, but we don't have minutes to give God in Christian service. The question is, what are you pursuing in your life? I truly believe with all my heart that we we are living in the last days. You say, every preacher has said that. Let me tell you, you study prophecy, you're going to know things are happening around us that God has prophesied that are going to happen. I'm not trying to be a doomsday preacher, but I am trying to be real and preach the word of God for what it is. God is coming back soon, and there's a lot of people that are not ready. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Apathy can be one of the worst sins that creeps into the church. Apathy is just like, I'm comfortable and I don't want to move. I promise you, when God says, run the race that is set before you, you better get up and it's time to move. And the last part of this is he says this. It's the instruction in turn from their wicked ways. Can I tell you right now how vitally important that is? He wasn't just throwing something else into the list. God is saying, if I am the answer and I am the only way, and God said, let me tell you, when it comes to the power of God, you cannot pamper sin. You cannot pamper sin and experience the power of God. God is very clear when he says in this passage, he said, you want to hear from heaven? You want to experience what God has? You better bow the knee before God, surrender, and allow God to point out what is right. It is time for us to quit being dictated by the world what is right and wrong. I don't care if it is accepted by the world. If God declares for it to be wicked, you better step away from it. We blame the world and society and the decline of humanity for the problems that we're doing. Have you ever thought that maybe a lot of the problems that we're having is just simply self-inflicted? We live in sin. We'll go to church and talk about the love of God and there's people that we won't even talk to because we've written them off in our minds. Praise God, God didn't do that with you. How dare we talk about forgiveness when we won't forgive somebody that's offended us from our past. Wicked ways. 
We are people that hold on to bitterness. We are people that are prideful. We are people that won't spend our time on our knees. And you say, I'm just not praying. God turns around and says, have you ever thought that it's pride holding you back because you're not willing to bow your knee before God? Have we become the generation that is so entertained with our TikToks that we'll sit there and watch pornography or soft porn or however you want to label it to make yourself feel good and you wonder why you're not experiencing the power of God when you're dabbling in sin? Have you thought about us being the generation that goes after a righteous God to live purity and righteously, but we will in a heartbeat sleep with the opposite sex before we're married and ask God to bless our relationships when God says that is sin. Say, you just offended me. Well, now you know how it feels because we've been offending God for a long time. We so bad want that we want to experience the hand of God, but we reject the face of God. I want your provision. I want your healing. I want you to fix this, give this, turn this around, provide my job. We want the hand of God. But that passage didn't say, seek the hand of God. That passage was very clear that we are to seek the face of God. That is the presence of God. That is the character of God. That is who he is. How dare we want just what he does and not who he is? When we talk about it, it's not about religion, it's about a relationship, but we make it about his provision and not just his presence. There is a difference. When Jesus or God was about to call Moses to do something special and powerful and they were in the desert place, and there was this thorny bush. It was a nothing there in the middle of the wilderness, but it was consumed with the power of God. He said, I see a bush and it's burning, but it's not consumed. You know what that is? It wasn't about the thorny bush. It was about the presence of God resting upon something, what God was about to do with Moses. Moses was in the backside of the wilderness in the place of desert where there was nothing going on. It was just dead and barren. And he thought God was done with him. And he walked in that present and he says, I am that I am. I have a job for you. And Moses begins to approach the presence of God and God says, stop. Lesson number one, I am a holy God. I am a righteous God. Be holy for I am holy. The place where you're at, when you step in the presence of the great I am, you are stepping into the presence of holiness. Take off your shoes and acknowledge that you're walking into the presence of God. You say, what is the point of that? The point of that is the fact that his dirt gathers on his feet from being in this world. God was not saying that there's not more dirt that was in front of him. Get the spiritual picture. He said, I want you to acknowledge that where you're at in the presence of God is different than where you were in the presence of the world. It is different. Act different. Live different. Set it aside. Turn from your wicked ways is not I've messed up and I've done wrong. God says it's time for change. It's time for change. You want revival? You're sick of school shootings? Well, where's the power of God resting in the local church? And you want God to work in the local schools when God's not even putting his presence in here? Turn from your wicked ways. Acknowledge your sin and be willing to do something about it. It's time for us to adjust our entertainment, adjust our thought life, get things right, have restitution and restoration among relationships and people. Show up, do what is right, act like you are a Christian, live like you are a Christian, live out the love of God. We want revival, and God says he wants it too, but he's waiting for us to bow the knee. Bow the knee. Bow the knee. Yes. Go ahead, take, put Second Chronicles on the front of your Bible. Hang it in your wall. Post it on your Facebook. Put it on your reels. I, I don't care what you do, but I promise you, you'll never experience what he says at the end of it. He literally says this, and I think we underestimate then. Do you know what he's saying then? If you do this, if my people pray, if is an option. If is something that I'm saying that you're not going to have to do. But if you're sick of the brokenness and heal your land, then you better understand it's only if you do these things. And the if is not just praying. If is bowing the knee before an almighty God. That's what he's saying. If you'll do, then he'll 
hear from heaven. Have you ever thought about how powerful that is in a world that is so messed up and so broken and so saturated with sin? God says, I will look down from a holy place of heaven and reach down into a wicked place of you and I will do what you cannot do. Because there's nothing horizontally in this world that will ever fix your issues. But I promise you vertically to an almighty God, He's got all the answers. I will forgive your sin. I'll break down the wall that separates you. I'll take off your shoes and allow you to come into the presence of God that the power of God might rest upon the thorny bush. You say, I am nothing. You are nothing, but you are powerful in the presence of the great I am to rise up to be the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. People that stand up to be the children of God. And I will heal your land. That word heal right there means rapha. The God that mends brokenness. The God that heals. The God that puts the pieces back together. And I know heaven is our healing. But I promise you, as I live in this world, greater is he that is in me than he's in this world. I'm not talking about every issue is going to go away. That ain't happened till heaven. But I promise you, God has called his people to make a difference. If we pray.